Senator Rand Paul spoke to students at Howard University. The Kentucky Republican talked about his party's history of opposing slavery and about civil rights. Howard University, located in Washington, D.C., is a historically black college founded after the Civil War. Senator Paul also took questions at this 50-minute event. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank President Rabot, uh, former Mayor Smoke, and uh, Howard University faculty and students for letting me come today. Now, some people have asked me, are you nervous about speaking at Howard? They say, you know, some of the students there, they may be Democrats. <laughs> so uh, my response has been, you know what? The trip will be a success if I can get the hilltop to have a headline that says, a Republican came to Howard, but he came in peace. <laughs> My wife Kelly asked me last week, she said, do you ever have doubts? Do you ever have doubts about trying to advance a message for an entire country? The truth is, sometimes. When I do have doubts, I think of a line from T.S. Eliot, a line that says, how should I presume? to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And when I think of how political enemies often twist and distort my positions, I think again of Eliot's words, and I think, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, how should I presume? And here I am today at Howard, a historically black college. Here I am, a guy who once presumed to discuss a section of the Civil Rights Act. That didn't always go so well for me. Some have said that I'm either brave or crazy to be here today. I've never been, though, one to sit by and watch the world go by without participating. I wake up every day hoping to make a difference. I take to heart the words of Toni Morrison of Howard University, who wrote, if there is a book you really want to read that hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. Now, I can recite lots of books, books that have been written, or I can plunge into the arena and stumble, maybe fall, but at least I will have tried. What I'm about is a philosophy that leaves you to fill in the blanks. I came to Howard today not to preach or prescribe to you some special formula for you, but to say that I want a government that leaves you alone, that encourages you to write the book that becomes your future. You're more important than any political party, more important than any political pleadings or partisan pleadings. The most important thing you will do is yet to be seen. For me, I found my important thing to do when I learned to do surgery on the eye, when I learned to restore people's vision. I found what was important when I met my wife, when I got married. You're still, many of you have those things that lay ahead of you. Although I'm an eye surgeon, first and foremost, I find myself at this particular time in a debate over how we heal our sick economy and how we get people back to work. I truly believe that we have an economy that could create millions of jobs, but we have to rethink our arguments and try to rise above partisan rhetoric. My hope is that you'll hear me out, that you'll see me for who I am and not a caricature that's sometimes presented by political opponents. If you hear me out, I believe you'll discover that what motivates me more than any other issue is the defense of everyone's rights. Of strong importance to me is the defense of minority rights, not just racial minorities, but ideological and religious minorities. If our government does not protect the rights of minorities, then democratic majorities could simply legislate away our freedoms. The Bill of Rights and Civil War Amendments protect us against the possibility of oppressive federal or state government. The fact that we are a constitutional republic means that certain inalienable rights are protected even from democratic majorities. The majority can't vote to take away your rights. They're yours, they're given to you by your creator. No Republican questions or disputes civil rights. I've never wavered in my support for civil rights or the Civil Rights Act. The dispute, if there is one, has always been about how much of the remedy should come under federal or state or private purview. What gets lost is that the Republican Party has always been the party of civil rights and voting rights. Because Republicans believe that the federal government is limited, though, and that its function 
is limited by the Constitution. Some have concluded that Republicans are somehow inherently insensitive to minority rights. Nothing could be further from the truth. Republicans do indeed still believe many rights remain with the people and the states respectively. When some people hear that, they tune us out and they say, oh, he's just using code words for states' rights to discriminate, for the states' rights to segregate and to abuse. But that's just simply not true. Many Republicans do believe that decentralization of power is the best policy, that government is more efficient, more just, and more personal when it's smaller and more local. But Republicans also realize that there are occasions and have been occasions of such egregious injustice that they do require federal involvement, that that's precisely what the 14th Amendment was about and what the Civil Rights Act was intended to do, protect citizens from state and local tyranny. The 14th Amendment says no state shall. The 14th Amendment did change the Constitution to give a role for the federal government in protecting citizenship and voting, regardless of race. Now, I didn't live through segregation, nor did I experience it firsthand. I did grow up in the South, in public schools. I went to schools with whites, blacks, Latinos. We all seemed to pretty much get along. So perhaps some will say that I can't, I can't understand. But, it, but I don't think you had to be there to be affected by our nation's history of racial strife. The tragedy of segregation and Jim Crow in the South is compounded when you realize that integration began in New England in 1840s and 1850s. In 1841, Frederick Douglass is pulled from the white car on the Eastern Railroad, clutching his seat so tightly that when he's thrown from the train, it's, the remnants of the seat are still in his hands. But within a few years, public transportation was integrated in the Northeast. It's a stain on our history that integration didn't occur for more than a hundred more years in the South. In the 1960s, we were still fighting to integrate transportation in schools, and that was and is an embarrassment. But the story of emancipation, of voting rights, and of citizenships from Frederick Douglass to the modern era is really, in fact, the history of the Republican Party. How did the party that elected the first black U.S. Senator the party that elected the first 20 African-American congressmen, how did that party become a party that now loses 95% of the black vote? How did the Republican Party, the party of the great emancipator, lose the trust and faith of an entire race? From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement for a century, most black Americans voted Republican. How did we lose that vote? To understand how Republicans lost the African-American vote, we must first understand how we won the African-American vote. In Kentucky, the history of black voting rights is inseparable from the Republican Party. After the Civil War, virtually all African-Americans became Republicans. Democrats in Louisville were led by the Courier-Journal editor, Henry Watterson, and they were implacably opposed to blacks voting. The Democrats, to a person, were opposed to blacks voting. Watterson himself, who was the editor for 30 or 40 years of the Courier Journal, wrote that his opposition to blacks voting was founded upon the conviction that their habits of life and general condition disqualified them from the judicious exercise of suffrage. This was the Democrats. In George Wright's Life Behind the Veil, he writes of Republican General John Palmer, standing before tens of thousands of slaves on July 4th, 1865, when slavery still existed, in Kentucky and declaring, my countrymen, you are free. And while I command the military forces of the United States will defend your right to freedom. And the crowd erupted in cheers. This is the history of the Republican Party. Meanwhile, Kentucky's Democrat controlled legislature voted against the 13th, the 14th and the 15th amendments. In Louisville, William Worley was a black Republican. He was born at the end of the 19th century. He was a founder of Louisville's NAACP. He's a Republican. Most of the founders of the NAACP were Republicans. He's famous, though, for fighting and overturning the notorious Louisville segregated housing ordinance. Worley bought a house in a white section in defiance of a city segregation law. The case, Buchanan v. Worley, was finally decided by the Supreme Court in 1917, unanimously holding that the Kentucky law could not forbid the sale of a house based on race. 
The Republican Party's history is rich and chock full of emancipation and black history. Republicans still prize the sense of justice that MLK spoke of when he said that an unjust law is any law that a, minor that a majority enforces on a minority but does not make binding upon itself. Speech would be entertaining, but now, but now, but now you've had some entertainment. When when MLK talked about an unjust law, what always has intrigued me about this is a lot of the things MLK talked about were race, but really what he talked about when he talked about what was a just law goes beyond race. So listen to this again. He said that an unjust law. And this is a good way to look at any law. An unjust law is any law that a majority, not just a racial majority, any majority, enforces on a minority but does not make binding, binding on themselves. It means any law that's not universally applied. Any law that applies to just bankers would be not racist but would be unjust. Any law that just applied to one particular group would be unjust. Now, he was referring to race, but he said something about unjustness that applies to all law. Republicans have never stopped believing that minorities, whether they derive from the color of your skin or the shade of your ideology, should warrant equal protection. Everyone knows of the sit-ins in Greensboro and Nashville, but few people remember the sit-in in Alexandria Public Library in 1938. Samuel Tucker, a lawyer and a graduate of Howard University, recruited five young African-American men to go to the public library, select a book, and sit and read until they were forcibly removed. In 1938, the sit-ins of the 1960s had a lot of a long history before. Tucker's sit-in set the stage, though, for students who organized a sit-in at Woolworths in Greensboro that brought down Jim Crow in many areas years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I think that in our retelling of the Civil Rights era, we don't give enough credit to the heroism of the civil disobedience that brought down Jim Crow. You may say, oh, that's all well and good, but that was a long time ago. What have you done for me lately? I think what happened during the Great Depression was that African Americans understood that Republicans did champion citizenship and voting rights, but they became impatient because they wanted economic emancipation. African Americans were languishing, and they languished below white Americans in every measure of economic success, and the Depression was especially harsh for those who were on the lowest rung of poverty at that time. The Democrats promised equalizing outcome, everybody will get something, through unlimited federal assistance. While Republicans offered something that seemed to be less tangible, the promise of equalizing opportunity through free markets. Now, Republicans face a daunting task. Several generations of black voters have never voted Republican and are not very open to considering the option. Democrats still promise unlimited federal assistance and Republicans still offer free markets, low taxes, less regulation, but because we truly believe it will create millions of jobs for everyone. The Democrat promise is tangible, puts food on the table, but too often, I think, doesn't lead to jobs or meaningful success. The Republican promise is for policies that create economic growth. We believe lower taxes, less regulation, balanced budgets, a solvent Social Security, a solvent Medicare, will all stimulate growth. Republicans point to the Reagan era, when the economy grew at 7%. We added 8 million jobs in a few years during the Reagan administration. If we did that again, we could conceivably create 11, 12 million jobs, and we're creating almost no jobs at this point. Today, after four years of the current policy, one in six Americans live in poverty, more than at any time in recent history. In fact, the poor have grown poorer in the last four years. Black unemployment is 14%, nearly twice the national average. This is unacceptable. Using taxes to punish the rich, in reality, punishes everyone because we're all interconnected. High taxes and excessive regulation and massive debt are not working. This isn't just Democrats, it's Democrats and Republicans that have been piling on the debt, but the debt is a burden for you. The debt is an impediment to you getting a job when you leave here. 
The economy has been growing at less than 1% and actually contracted in the last quarter of last year. I would argue that the objective evidence shows that big government is not a friend to African Americans. Big government relies on the Federal Reserve, our central bank, to print money out of thin air. Printing money out of thin air leads to higher prices. When the prices of gas rise to $4 a gallon, it's a direct result of your government's debt. When food prices rise, it's a direct result of $50,000 we borrow every second. Inflation hurts everyone, particularly the poor. If you're struggling to get ahead, if you have student loans and personal debt, you should choose a political party that wants to leave more money in the private sector so you'll get a job when the time comes. Some Republicans, let's call them the moss-covered variety, mistake war for defense. They forget that Reagan argued for peace through strength, not war through strength. The old guard argues for arming Gaddafi, and then the next year they argue that we want boots on the ground to defeat Gaddafi. They've got to be involved everywhere all the time. I want you to know that there are Republicans who don't clamor for war, that many Republicans believe in a strong national defense that serves to preserve the peace. In Louisville, in the predominantly African-American west end of town, it was recently announced that 18 school districts are failing, or 18 schools. The graduation rate from high school is 40%. The head of Kentucky's education called it academic genocide. Johns Hopkins researchers call these schools dropout factories. I defy anyone to watch Waiting for Superman and honestly argue against school choice. A minister friend of mine in the West End calls school choice the civil rights issue of our day. I think he's right. By the sixth grade, Ronald Halasi was failing most of his classes, but through school choice, he was able to attend a Catholic school here in DC. There he learned that he had a natural gift for composing music. For that, he wasn't even reading. His reading level was so low that he struggled to even write lyrics. Ronald then went on to matriculate at Barry University. There are countless examples of the benefits of school choice. Talk to the parents of these kids. Look at the kids that were interviewed in the movie Waiting for Superman. Maybe it's about time we all reassess blind allegiance to ideas that are failing our children. Every child in every neighborhood of every color, class, and background deserves a school that will help them succeed. Those of you assembled today are the American success stories. You will make it and do great things. But in every neighborhood, white, black, or brown, there are kids who are not succeeding because they simply made mistakes or they messed up. They had kids maybe before they were married or before they were old enough to support them or they got hooked on drugs or they simply left school. Republicans are often miscast as uncaring or condemning of kids who make bad choices. I for one plan to change that. I'm working with Democratic senators to make sure that kids who have made bad decisions such as nonviolent possession of drugs are not imprisoned for lengthy sentences. I'm working to make sure that first-time offenders are put into counseling and not imprisoned with hardened criminals. We should not take away anyone's future over one mistake. Let me tell you the story of two young men. Both of them made mistakes. Both of them were said to have used illegal drugs. One of them was white from a privileged background. He had important friends, an important father, and an important grandfather. You know, the kind of family who universities name dorms after. This family had more money than you could count. Drugs or no drugs, his family could buy justice if he needed it. The other man also used illegal drugs, but he was of mixed race and from a single parent household with little money. He didn't have important friends or a wealthy father. Now you may think I'm gonna tell you a story about racism in America where the rich white kid gets off and the black kid goes to jail. It could be. It often is, but that's not this story. In this story, both young men were extraordinarily lucky. Both young men were not caught using illegal drugs and they weren't imprisoned. Instead, they went on to become presidents of the United States. Barack Obama and George Bush were lucky. <laughs> the law could have put both of them away for their entire young adulthood. Neither one of them would have been employable, much less president. Some argue with evidence that our drug laws are biased, that they are the new Jim Crow. But to simply be against them for that reason misses a larger point. They are unfair to everyone. 
white, black, brown, largely because of this idea that one size fits all, this idea that federal sentences should have no discretion. Our federal mandatory minimum sentences are simply heavy-handed and arbitrary. They can affect anyone at any time, though they disproportionately affect those without the means to fight them. We should stand and loudly proclaim, enough's enough. We should not have laws that ruin the lives of young men and women who have committed no violence. That's why I've introduced a bill to repeal mandatory minimum sentences. We should not have drug laws or a court system that disproportionately punishes the black community. The history of African-American repression in this country rose from government-sanctioned racism. It's important to remember that, from government-sanctioned racism. Jim Crow laws were a product of bigoted state and local governments. Big and oppressive government has long been the enemy of freedom, something black Americans know all too well and on a personal level. We must always embrace individual liberty and enforce the constitutional rights of all Americans, rich and poor, immigrant and native, black or white. Such freedom is essential in achieving any long-standing health and prosperity. As Toni Morrison said, write your own story. Challenge mainstream thought. I hope that some of you will be open to the Republican message that favors choice in education, a less aggressive foreign policy, more compassion regarding nonviolent crime, and encourages opportunity in employment. And when the time is right, I hope that African Americans will again look to the party of emancipation, civil liberty, and individual freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Paul. If you'll tell me, tell me your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Joshua Mathis. I'm actually a student at American University. Okay. And uh, thank you for coming out. Um, during your speech, you mentioned uh, that you have support, um, uh, that you want a government that leaves you alone. Um, and you've been one of the fiercest opponents of federal interference with uh, local autonomy and local rights. So how can you justify killing last year's D.C. budget autonomy bill and also interfering with the uh, local legislation of our locally elected government? Uh, good question. First of all, when, when partisans discuss an issue, sometimes you only hear one side, so I'll tell you the other side of this. I didn't kill any D.C. autonomy bill. They could have had a vote at any point in time. I have no power to stop any legislation. I'm in the minority, and I put on amendments that they did not want to vote on. So they perceived that as killing the bill, but my intention was to get votes on some amendments. And they have the majority. The, the Democrat majority could have easily voted mine down, but they didn't, they didn't choose to vote on them. So it's kind of interesting. Like right now we're having this gun debate, and they say, oh, I'm preventing the debate from happening. I'm not preventing any debate from happening. They just have to agree to vote and, and uh, to move forward. They chose not to vote. On D.C. autonomy, I'm of two minds. Do I think maybe D.C. could have more autonomy? Maybe. But I also know that the Constitution put D.C. under Congress's purview and that we give D.C. money from the rest of the country, from the tax receipts. So I think that oversight on the money that we spend, it is incumbent. It's a responsibility of the Constitution and a, and a budgetary responsibility that we have oversight on the money that we spend from the U.S. Treasury in D.C. So I, I think it is a tough uh, road to walk, but I'm willing to look at uh, budgetary authority and see if we can come to a, a resolution. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Julian Lewis. I'm a senior political science major from Memphis, Tennessee, and I would just like to thank you for coming to Howard University and speaking with us. Uh, my question is, well, first of all, I'm a former White House intern for President Obama, 
And I would just like to say the, pre the president is doing an excellent job, just so y'all have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm being very sincere. Uh, I'm also a national field organizer for 1911 United. It's uh, one of the only African-American super PACs for President Obama in the entire country. We helped raise over $80,000 for him. Um, you said that uh, the Republican Party is a big proponent uh, of voting rights. And I have been traveling uh, along with members of my organization all over the country, across 30 states, uh, registering uh, African Americans to vote at a higher rate in 2012 than in 2008, because the Republican Party has been uh, using their state legislators and their governments to prevent African Americans from voting because they didn't want to elect President Obama. So I'm asking you, how can we believe what you're saying in regards to voting rights when we honestly feel based on our intellectual ability to gauge whether you can connect with us or not? How can you say that to us? Um, yeah. What I would say is me being here today and me trying to open this dialogue is, is that I'm trying to say the Republican Party is interested in the African American community and trying to convince some that our ideas, maybe not all immediately, but some that our ideas are the best for people having hope and jobs. As far as trying to prevent, I think it's important to know in the history what happened. Democrats in the South were very, very harsh, almost all Democrats, okay? That's who ran the governments. And they did have tests at the polls, literacy tests and special tests. And guess what? If you were white and you came forward, you didn't have to do the test. If you were black, you had to do the test and you didn't pass the test. People were scared and intimidated and preventing from voting. I think if you liken using a driver's license to literacy tests, you demean the horror of what happened in the 40s and 50s, maybe probably from 1910 all the way through 1960s in the South. It was horrific. Nobody is in favor of that. No Republican is in favor of that. But showing your driver's license to have an honest election, I think, is not unreasonable. And I think that's the main thing Republicans have been for. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator, for coming. We really appreciate it. My name is Emmanuel Lewis. I'm a junior health sciences major here at Howard University and a member of the Howard University Royal Court. And my question is, I believe that we must... Um, we must first define which Republican Party, and this is what I want to ask you: Are we discussing Republican Party um, post nineteen, you know, before nineteenth century, nineteenth century Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln Republican Party, or are we discussing post nineteen sixty eight Republican Party, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan? And my question for you is: Which one do you identify with? Right. I think that's a great question, and that hits the nail on the head exactly as to what, what our obstacles are, because people, including those who may have just clapped, perceive there as being completely different parties. And you don't object to the party of emancipation and voting rights and citizenship and all of that of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The argument that I'm trying to make is we haven't changed. We don't talk about it. it, and that you, it, it I'm either going to convince you or not, but my argument is we, there are some of us who haven't changed, who are still part of that, that, the, the party that you liked, but there are part of us who, who truly believe Reagan was still part of that, that we don't, think, we don't see an abrupt difference. We don't see all of a sudden, see, we see horrible Jim Crow and horrible racism that happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s. It was all Democrats. It wasn't Republicans. Now, did some of them switch over and become Republicans? Yes. But the Republican Party primarily, primarily we're, we're not those people. And so it's an argument, an obstacle. I'll give you one example. The first, uh, uh, one of the African-American uh, U.S. senators was a guy named, uh, blanking on his name, from Massachusetts. Brooks. Brooks, Edwin Brooks. And his, his, <laughs> Howard graduate, yes. And, uh, but his comment, his comment was, uh, I, thought, I thought a pretty interesting comment. His comment was, if Democrats had the incredible history of abolition, emancipation, voting rights, and of being for all of the Civil War amendments, you'd hear about it all the time, because Democrats are good at, at talking about stuff like that. He said, Republicans have done a terrible job 
And that's why I think we have to resurrect some of this. I mean, how many of you would have, if I would have said, who do you think the founders of the NAACP are? Do you think they were Republicans or Democrats? Would everybody in here know they were all Republicans? Yes. All right, all right. You know more than I know. And, and, okay, and that's, and, and I don't mean that to be insulting. I don't know what you know and you don't, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find out what the connection is. But the thing is, is that I think the general public doesn't we in the Republican Party hasn't talked enough about the the great history and interaction between the Republican Party and black history and voting rights in our country and I would try to make the argument and it's an uphill battle I mean frankly it is an uphill battle for me to try to convince you that we haven't changed but that's part of me being here and that's what I'm trying to do anyway yes, ma'am. good morning my name is Quanda Trice and I'm a Navy veteran from Murray Kentucky oh great <laughs> And I am a doctoral student here at Howard University, majoring in political science. My question is, is that uh, this week in Kentucky, we've had a lot of victories this week, including the legalization of a hemp bill for industrial purposes and what have you. My question to you is being from Callaway County, McCracken County, and all of those different places and that nick and cranny, there have been such a large number of African Americans who have been incarcerated for drug issues. My question to you is, how are you going to take this industrialized new economic boost and actually allow African Americans, other people that have been disenfranchised, the poor to actually benefit from this industrialization that's going forth in our great state? Thank you for the question. I think it's a good question. It's also an example of if you want to see, am I trying to work with other sides? Am I maybe different than some Republicans you've ever met? I signed a letter with our Democrat governor to, uh, to, uh, to ask for a waiver from No Child Left Behind, and I'm also lobbying the Democrat governor and working with our Democrat congressman from Louisville on the hemp issue to try to get a waiver at the federal level. We now have a state law that's passed, but we have to get a waiver from the federal level in order to grow it. Now, it is important that we distinguish hemp and, and drugs are different things. Hemp's going to be a crop. It's not a drug. It's, it's a crop. You use it for paper. You use it for uh, rope. You use it for clothing, uh, biofuel. There's a lot of stuff. But it is a step forward. It was a huge victory. We won with 90% of the vote, and we started out. But this was something Republicans and Democrats working together. I hope the growing of it, that everybody will benefit from it, including African Americans. On the incarceration thing, I've got the bill on mandatory minimums. Kentucky's actually made some steps forward with having more local drug court. And I also want to distinguish that I'm not talking about standing up here saying drugs are good. What, what I'm saying is, is that even the most benign of the drugs that we talk about, marijuana, I think if you use it too much, you will lose IQ points. I think if you use it too much, you won't show up for class. I think you'll eat too many, I think you'll eat too many Doritos. You know. <laughs> I think there's a lot of things that aren't good about it, but also if you make a mistake and choose to do that, kids are forever doing stuff until they're 25 that they shouldn't be doing, and then all of a sudden they turn 25 and a light bulb goes off or they get married or something, and they tend to settle down more. But I just don't want to see them in jail, and I will do everything I can to keep nonviolent criminals out of jail. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Senator. My name is Thomas Smith. I'm a freshman finance major in the School of Business from New Orleans. Uh, changing from the more social civil rights talk, uh, you famously filibustered the confirmation of a CIA chief in the Obama administration based on the Obama administration's lack of transparency in counterterrorism, specifically the drone program. Um, my question starts with your fellow Senator John Chester from Montana gave testimony on the floor of the Senate against a recently anonymously added bill with a provision that gives legal cover to agribusiness and a provision which, quoting the Senator Tester, says the USDA has the right to ignore any judicial rulings, judicial rulings on GMO crops. Um, those in your ideological party, um, the Tea Party, have spoken out vehemently against it. And did you have any knowledge of the provision on the floor and the floor testimony of uh, John Tester from Montana? And if you did, why did it not deserve the filibuster the CIA confirmation did or right. your proposed filibuster of any gun legislation? Okay. Help me understand a little bit again, just in your own words again. It, this was about, G, it was about GMO, the genetically modified corn and yeah, things like it's, that. It's and, been and, commonly called the Monsanto Protection Act. Okay. 
And, but explain to me again exactly what – we had a lot of votes recently, and I'm not sure I know the details real well of this. It's, okay, it's, well, uh, Senator John Tester, Democrat from Montana, was on the Senate floor, and uh, he pointed out a provision in a recent appropriations bill, I believe it was, having to do a lot with agriculture. And in it, there was a provision that basically, in his words, tells the USDA to ignore any judicial rulings or possible judicial rulings um, – on GMO foods, which, 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 in sen which, which in a sense could give legal cover, legal immunity to agribusness, like yeah, the companies I, like I'm a, I, you know, and I, I can't remember if we actually had a vote on this or not. Did it pass well, by voice vote? Yeah, yes, it was passed and signed by President by, Obama by, by voice vote. You know, I think that uh, I'm against giving immunity to big corporations in general. Okay, I think, for example, and this is a different subject, but maybe related, is that when we give immunity, like for Google, to turn over your records of what you search on your computer, I think that's a mistake because then they're going to violate your contract. The same with uh, Monsanto or any company. If there's an obligation to deliver food that is not harmful to you and they deliver something that a court uh, says is harmful, then I think we should go with the courts and that the government shouldn't override that. The specific vote I'll have to look into because I, I really don't remember the details. But that's the best I can do for an answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Brandon Patterson. I'm a sophomore economics major, political science minor from Chicago. And um, my question is, recently the state of Maryland repealed the use of the death penalty. A lot of organizations, including the NAACP, which I'm a part of, have been working to get capital punishment repealed nationwide because it is applied unfairly to racial minorities. So I wanted to get your views on the death penalty and the purpose it serves in our criminal justice system today, if any. Yeah, I have, uh, have mixed feelings on the death penalty. I think of it sometimes in a personal way that if someone came into my house and killed my wife, if I were there at the time, I'd have no problem pulling the trigger to kill him to defend my wife. Also, a week or two later, I, I just don't know if I'm a forgiving enough person. I'd be probably for executing. I mean, just that's my emotion coming out. But I also realize that the court system's made mistakes, you know. And even while I'm a big, huge fan of our court system of having a trial by jury and having a judge and having all those things, still there are evidence, and some of it comes from Illinois on rape, uh, where some rape cases with, involving murder also it was proven time after time that they were making mistakes, um, that the courts were making mistakes. So I do have some reservations, and I'm not sure I know exactly what the answer is. I do think that most penalties for crime should be done at the state level, not the federal level. So I'm not a big fan of federal death sentences for anything other than maybe treason. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Senator. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Darian Unger. I'm a professor here in the School of Business. Um, I, I thank you for coming, dis, despite the fact that you have spoken out against the, the against the Civil Rights Act, against the Voting Rights Act, and and you've you've done it as a champion of individual liberties and states' rights, and and so I wonder, aside from the the moral reasons not to discriminate, of which there are many, what when is it okay legally to discriminate, according to you? Well, I think it's a mischaracterization of my uh, position, mischaracterization. Uh, I've never been against the Civil Rights Act, ever. And, and my, I still continue to be for the Civil Rights Act as well as enforcement of the 14th Amendment. Well, the, the, I mean, the, there was a, I mean, there was the, a long, was there was a, there was a long, one interview that had a long extended conversation about the ramifications beyond race. And I have been concerned about the ramifications of certain portions of the Civil Rights Act beyond race, as they are now being applied to smoking, uh, menus, uh, you know, listing calories and things on menus, and guns. And so I do question some of the ramifications and the extensions, but I've never questioned the Civil Rights Act and never uh, come out in opposition to the Civil Rights Act, nor have I ever introduced anything to alter the Civil Rights Act. So your characterization is incorrect. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Jabari Zakia. I'm a native Washingtonian living in the colonial city of uh, Banneker City. And to correct you, D.C. residents pay more in federal taxes than they get back from the federal government. But my questions are this. Um, the 14th Amendment was passed to protect those enslaved Africans coming out of slavery 
and not corporations. Do you believe that corporations are people that have the same protections as natural citizens without any of the negativities of, of natural citizens? And my second question is that the Constitution requires that Congress declare war. The power to declare war is in the Congress' hand. Uh, Bill Clinton was impeached by the Republican uh, House because he allegedly lied about an affair. Um, based on that premise, should George B. Bush be considered a war criminal for lying to getting the United States into the war with Iraq? And in the same provision, should Barack Obama be, be impeached for getting into Libya without an act of Congress? Uh, how about yes, no, no, yes, no? <laughs> No, seriously, I'll try to answer so, some of the questions. On corporations, whether they should be people, they're obviously not the same as people. So you don't get a trial by jury and you don't have habeas corpus and, and necessarily the same due process as an individual gets. And I think sometimes corporations, particularly big corporations, use government to get special privileges and I'm against that. I'm against special tax deductions for corporations. I'm also against anything that takes your money and props up or gives special privilege to corporations. However, on the other side, corporations do have a very important function in our society. So let's say when you graduate and you get out, you start a plumbing business. And you want, you're doing pretty well, you're doing pretty well, but then someone sues you. One of your pipes break and it was an accident, maybe your supplier wasn't good, but now all of your profit, all of your assets are taken by the courts. Should they be able to also get your house and anything like bankruptcy? So bankruptcy is debated all the time on whether it should go towards creditors or towards the, uh, the debtor. And I think there has to be some balance and there has to be some protection because it does help you. You'll meet people in your life who've been bankrupt three times and then go on to hit it big. And if we ruin them, we don't put people in prison for anymore, but if we ruined them and said, oh, we're going to take your house and everything else, I also see it from my perspective. I'm a physician. I try to do my best all the time, but I'm human. Has anybody ever had an infection that I operated on? But should they be able to come and take my house and things that I've worked for for 20 or 30 years? I have a corporation that somewhat secludes me from people coming and taking their house. So I think about that on corporations. It's not all big, huge corporations, sometimes it's mom and pops or individual businesses like your parents might have. On declaration of war, absolutely, I'm opposed to Republican or Democrat presidents taking us to war without a declaration. <laughs> Let's, how about two more? Yeah. Yeah, Good. Only Just the two at the microphones, we'll do this. Good afternoon, Senator Paul. My name is Charles Zetta Wilson. I'm a graduate student here at Howard University in the physics department. My question is in reference to something you said earlier in your speech, namely that you are for the markets being free. I actually am someone who agrees that markets should be free, but I wonder to what degree. For example, uh, the idea of there being no longer an EPA or, or USDA in order to regulate things that are healthful or non-healthful healthful for citizens to me is a problem. Also, the idea that, for example, the Monsanto's Protection Act can be sort of tucked into various types of le legislation or other types of cronyism capitalism is is upsetting to me and so my question is to what degree is the republican party and you in particular dedicated to making sure that free markets are in fact free i think it's a good question it's also something where i think we've done a poor job i would say republicans have done a poor job promoting that we believe in protections of the environment and I think we can, do, we can do a better job. I, for one, believe that if you believe in strict property rights and no one should pollute their neighbor's property and you should get absolute injunctions, you can't pollute them just a little bit, you know, you, you just can't pollute your neighbor's property. So the, the Clean Water Act, I think, is, is, a, is and has an appropriate um, purpose or goal. The Clean Water Act says you can't discharge pollutants into the navigable streams of America. What does that mean to me? Chem chemical company is not allowed and should not be allowed to dump chemicals in the Ohio River, okay? Absolutely. 
But you know what it's come to believe over time, so I'm not opposing having rules. What the Clean Water Act has become, though, is we now say that dirt is a pollutant and we say that your backyard is a navigable stream. We've just gone too far. The Sackett family, this went to the Supreme Court last year, bought a $25,000 lot near a lake, not on a lake, no rivers, no streams, no ponds. It's a quarter of an acre lot. They began putting gravel on it. The EPA sent them a note and said, you are now being fined $75,000 a day. And they said, why? They said, it's a wetlands. Going back to the Clean Water Act. So we took something that was well-intentioned to stop chemical companies from dumping chemicals in the water, and we are now using it to abuse a middle-class family that just put some gravel on a lot that never has any water on it. They then had the audacity to tell them, you have no recourse in court. So they fought it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, this is America, for goodness sakes. The government just can't come take your property without you getting your day in court. So really, my answer to you would be, we need to do a better job saying we believe in, in a clean environment, that we do believe in rules, but that the balance has shifted too far, and we're now abusing property rights and abusing farmers and small property owners, and we need to shift the balance back. And that if you shift the balance of regulations too strongly, you lose jobs. And I think that's where we are now, that we have so many regulations that we're losing jobs. Last question. Good morning, Senator. My name is Jeffrey Muhammad. I'm a former business student here at this. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C. How are you, sir? Very good. Is that the question? Well, my, I'm a, when I was uh, here in the School of Business, I went to one of my uh, teacher's office, and um, he said to me, you all killed Malcolm X. And I was taken back. Say, say, it, say it one more time. He said that we killed Malcolm X. Malcolm X? Yes. So who's, then who's we? Basically, I'm Jeffrey Muhammad. I'm of the Nation of Islam. No, but you're saying who's, your teacher said that we killed. Who's, who's well, here's we? my point, sir. Would okay. you agree to open the files to who killed Malcolm X, and what's your position on Minister Louis Farrakhan's request? Can I ask some patience, please? Right. Yeah, now let's, let's be, let's give him a chance. Let's yeah. give him a chance. I want to know what your position is on Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's request for a separate nation and territory within America. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think my goal is really not separate but equal, but sort of that we're going to all be the same someday without trying to be separate. And I think we're getting closer to that. And so I don't really want to see separation so much. What I would say, though, with regard to, uh, you know, um, and I, don't, I can't claim that I'm an expert on Malcolm X. I, you know, know a little bit. I would say that there were some things, and even from Louis Farrakhan, that have been said, and probably a lot of things I don't agree with, but there are some things that are talking about uh, empowerment, taking, uh, being a good person, taking it upon yourself to be a good um, citizen in your community that probably Malcolm X and Louis Farrakhan are in favor of that I would agree to. I don't like the idea of separation. I think we should be moving towards more work that we're not that different or Senator, really shouldn't be different at all under the law. Senator, I think this young man stood a long time. All right, we'll do one more. If it's got to be an easy question. Though. No problem. Good right. afternoon, Senator. My name is Keenan Glover. I'm an administration of justice major from Rochester, New York. Okay. A freshman as well. Um, you say you want to provide a government uh, that leaves us alone. Quite frankly, I don't want that. I want a government that is going to help me. I want a government that will help me fund my college education. I want a government that won't define me by my FAFSA nor by my family's income. I'm a dollar sign with a heartbeat in this nation. This society is mirrored image of Capitol Hill. Do you, Senator Rand Paul, have a formulated solution to come up with new American values so that the citizens of this nation have a worth of more than dead presidents and Ben Franklin? Um, I think what I would say when we go back to the, the that I want a government that leaves you alone. The main reason I say that, and we can disagree, but probably we're going to end up disagreeing. But what I would say is <laughs> that uh, the reason I say leaves me alone is the gentleman just stood up and people gave him a hard time, and probably most people here are not followers of Louis Farrakhan. But in America, you can live and be a follower of Louis Farrakhan if we leave you alone, and we ought to. 
And so we don't have to all agree on every issue. So, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of issues where we are all going to not agree on. But if we have a government that doesn't get involved in every issue, a government that kind of leaves you alone, doesn't mean no government, doesn't mean government's not involved in education. For example, one of the things I often say is, it's not that I believe in no government. I believe in a government that spends what comes in. And that's not that unreasonable. We bring in $2.6 trillion a year in money, but we're spending $3.8 trillion. So even though I think your education is important and maybe you have a student loan from the government, I'm not for borrowing it from China. I'm for figuring out how we get it out of the $2.6 trillion that comes in every year because I think if we borrow it from China, we're going to give you a student loan, you're going to graduate from Howard, and you're going to have $60,000 in debt, and then you got no job because we've borrowed so much money from China that we're ruining the economy. So it is beyond, we have to think beyond sometimes the immediate effects of, yeah, I want my student loan. And I'm not saying I'm against the student loans. I'm saying we have to be careful that if we give everybody in the country unlimited student loans and everybody goes to college, and that we become, the country becomes so indebted that there are no jobs, have we done you a service? So everything is a, it's a balancing act of trying to figure it out. And you and I may not completely agree, but I think leave me alone it is a good mantra for government because government has to be involved in certain things, but there are many things we can leave government out of. Please join me in thank, thank you. Former British.